this webinar so that if you miss it or want to pick up something later or want to share it with others in your chapter, you can log on to the NMA website, um, find it. It'll be available in a few days. Um, and then put it on, I like to say, you can do NMA webinars in your bunny slippers 24 seven, anytime, any place. So a um, couple of housekeeping items first. Uh, Semi is perfectly willing to take questions throughout. And I think how we're gonna handle that is, um, we'll ask you to put them in the chat room if you can, or um, raise your hand. Um, and the, our, our rule was if we see something that I think Semi wants to answer as he's talking, fine. Otherwise, we'll save everything uh, towards the end for a Q&A. So, because we want to get your input, that's one of the value adds, I think, to our NMA webinars. So, if you will, let me introduce our speaker. He is Mr. Patty Semi Bird. He is founder and executive director of Team Concepts Training Service and TCTS Leadership Academy in Richland, Washington. That's in the Tri-Cities in Washington State. Um, Semi has been from the battlefield to the boardroom and academia in between. Um, he, as an Army Specialist uh, Green Beret, he received two of our nation's highest awards for heroism and valor on the battlefield, the Bronze Star for Valor and the Purple Heart for wounds received in combat. He knows firsthand the value of developing high-performance teams and the impact on organizational performance. He's held several senior positions in training and leadership development, working in government, banking, and education. In his uh, last position, he led strateg strategic training initiatives as the Director of Training and Leadership Development for a U.S. government agency. Uh, he was on special assignment a couple of years ago where he served as Senior Advisor to the U.S. Ambassador in Bangladesh. He earned his first graduate degree from Villanova University, where he studied human resource development, and he's currently working on his Ph.D. So, um, many of you know, Semi has been at our annual conference as a keynoter and a two times, and so a stranger to many of you. So. Let me, at this point in time, turn the meeting over to our presenter, Mr. Patty Semi Bird. Semi, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Steve. Good morning, everybody. Uh, on behalf of uh, Team Concepts Training Services and the Leadership Academy, I'd like to welcome you to, to Leadership for the 21st Century. We're going to go over some uh, material that I think you're going to find highly beneficial as you move forward in your leadership growth. You know, one of the things that we see in the industry, and many of you out there are fully aware of this, is as we promote people, we typically promote people from within the organization who are good at what they were doing, right? As an operator, as a technician, as a senior engineer, and then we promote them up into a position where they're utilizing different job skills that they don't already have. For instance, leadership and management require a whole separate set of skills than civil engineering, mechanical engineering, project controls, et cetera. So I appreciate you guys being here and uh, educating yourselves and hopefully putting some tools in your toolkit so you'll be successful moving forward. When we look at leadership at the 20 for, for the 21st century, one of the things I, I, I had to ask myself is, what does that look like? Well, we're talking about different generations. You know, the largest generation leaving the workforce is my generation, baby boomers. Some of us are on our third retirement, depending on how old we are, you are. Um, but we're, we're, we're attriting like there's no tomorrow. And then the new generation that's coming in, the millennials and the zillennials, the brand new empirically qualified uh, generation is popping into the workforce by droves. And so how we operated and what motivated us during our time is much different than what these new uh, employees, this new workforce requires of us. And so we wrote a centric leadership theory I'm going to share that with you. I hope you find it value added, and we're going to drive on. If you look at your main screen, one of the things I wrote um, after spending some time in the Middle East, uh, uh, Iraq to be particular for this one uh, instance, I wrote a leader's abilities were often tested at the crossroads of adversity. And I was fortunate, Steve alluded to it in my introduction, that I, I received a, uh, a presidential medal um, for valor, but the medal was actually for leadership right, in combat, and without going into detail of what that was, I will say, <laughs> okay. having the abilities prior to finding myself in that situation 
was the reason why I'm here speaking with you today. You don't want to find yourself in a difficult situation and not have the tools to be successful. And that's how I look at our leadership journey, always looking to bring on tools and competencies to help us be successful. All right, let's drive this. So welcome to today's webinar. Another quote, I believe the two most important characteristics a leader can possess um, are the willingness to look inward and the courage to change. If you're not looking inward, if you're not looking to take an analysis of yourself and how you're doing, I wanna say you're wrong at the get-go. This has to be the foundation that drives our professional growth. How am I today? What are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? Where are my gaps? Looking at my organization, who are my people? Who are the people that I'm leading? What are their needs, right? And if we talk about treating others the way we wanna be treated, well, that was a wonderful, a wonderful aphorism, right? The golden rule, who can deny that? But there's another reality to that. I'm a warm and fuzzy, soft and squishy gummy bear kind of guy, right? I, I'm a social emotional person, but some of my best friends are very technical, very analytical. They don't need that soft touch when we approach or when they're approached. I personally do. I respond better, right? But if you try that personal approach with them, unaware of how you are, you may turn them off. You may have the opposite effect instead of motivating them, perhaps isolating them. And if you look at an MIT study that came out, MIT, the Sloan School, Sloan, they said, look, all of our empirical studies are showing this. When a person is more self-aware, they cannot have any better skill than that. So let's drive on. I'm going I'm to introduce you a little bit to myself. Many of you guys know me. Um, you know, I, most of my life was in the military. 23 years of military service, mostly in special operations and intelligence. Um, I spent time with the federal government, uh, with the Department of Energy and the Department of State. Um, I've been a law enforcement officer. I've been a federal officer. I am an entrepreneur and businessman. Um, I have some education, as Steve alluded to, in my PhD studies that I'm rounding into the fourth quarter on are in industrial and organizational psychology. I was going to start off in education because I love knowledge. I love education. But I said, for what I do, what is more appropriate? And it's understanding those psychological impacts on the workplace and how we engage with our staff. Many of you already know some of the problems that we find ourselves in most often are not technical related or regulatory issues or procedure issues. They're people issues. How do we deal with people? Hence my motivation to go into industrial and organizational psychology. So when we talk about leadership for the 21st century, I've got a couple objectives for you. I want to introduce you to employee-centric leadership theory or ECL, if you will. And then I give you kind of a, a start on your journey for finding your natural style of leadership. Here's the deal. A lot of people create curriculum and put on courses, and there's an expectation that once you leave that course, you're a changed person. I personally think that's a failed approach. I think you will always be the person you are. You have your natural tendencies. Again, being self-aware, I'm gonna recognize that and then take the tools or the skills that I learned in training, such as this webinar, and adapt it to me. That is gonna put you in a more optimal functioning position than trying to change yourself completely to fit the tools that you're trying to leverage. And so I'm also gonna introduce you to personal and professional intelligence theory, or it's a methodology we created to support employee-centric leadership theory. So let's get going. Um, first and foremost, this is a leadership webinar and not a management webinar. And many folks don't know the difference, so I'll take a shortcut. I'll probably repeat myself later. But leadership really deals with people, mostly people. Management usually and mostly deals with processes. And I've had clients that were directors of HR for large international conglomerates. And they're like, Simi, I never really thought of it that way. We've always combined it. There's nothing wrong with combining it as long as you know that there is a difference in different skills. So remember, leadership is a skill. And like any other skill, it's learned. You have to practice. Think of working out, right? Building a muscle, right? You gotta tear some muscle fibers. Being a good leader, you practice it. Sometimes it doesn't always work. But when we take those lessons learned and reapply again, we get better and we get better and we get stronger as a leader. Um, and again, I believe this. You have to be self-aware. We have to lead everyone and everyone is different. And it requires a lot of effort to say, look, um, I've got 50 employees. How can I possibly know everybody? 
be surprised what their capabilities are. And you're going to find that pretty soon. You're going to know each individual's motivations. All right, let's drive on. I'm going to talk to you about personal and professional intelligence, and only, I'm, I've got a screen for that. And we're going to really focus on people's side of it. So when you look at employee-centric leadership theory, um, it's pretty much an em emergent theory. And all that really means is this. We have empirical data, research that's already been done, right? And so I literally use existing research and proven theories and knowledge to say, well, employee-centric leadership, by taking the approach we're taking, focusing on our employees, putting them first, prioritizing them over mission, believe it or not. And yes, you just heard a military person who has spent time in combat who was saying, we need to put our employees as a priority over our mission. Who accomplishes the mission? Our employees. All right, driving on. Um, again, focusing on employees and engaging them at the highest levels. And the key word in that is engagement. Employee engagement. Employees that are engaged, just to throw a statistic out at you, depending on what study you look at, Gallup um, or any of the other ones, um, performance enhances by at least 45% when you are engaging your employees. When you're not engaging your employees, performance goes down. And if we look at the number one reasons why people quit, as you all know, they quit bad bosses. Personality problem, it's a, a, a personal issue. Not with the company, it's with their boss. All right, driving on employee-centric leadership theory. There's some numbers I just wanna put up there for you. You know, I, I believe, based on the numbers and based on the studies, that if you embrace this, you're gonna look at organizational performance increase anywhere from 25 to 50%, depending on where your company currently is. At the low end, you're gonna get a bump of at least 25% based on the trends we're working off of. You're gonna increase retention because when employees are happier and they're motivated, they tend to stay. Employees are more likely, especially with this new generation, to stay for intrinsic motivations, meaning they're not just looking for that next $10,000 per year raise. You'll be surprised how many people will stay on board even offered more money from another organization because they're happy where they're at. They realize if I leave, I'm not gonna get this kind of treatment anywhere else. So they're more likely gonna stay on board. We're gonna find team cohesion, people working better together. We're gonna, we're gonna model those behaviors and we're gonna help them thrive in that work in that organization and environment. All right, All right Carl von Clausewitz here. You're looking at going, okay, European gentleman, don't know him, never heard of him. All right, maybe you've heard of uh, some of the theories he, he wrote. So, Carl was a, a Prussian general, a military theorist. He led a, a European, Europe's most prestigious leadership academies back in the day, and you can see the years there. But he created the concept of center of gravity, if that sounds familiar to any of you. He also created the fog of war. And I'm gonna walk through that and explain it a little bit more in detail, but I'm gonna keep it simple. I'm gonna keep it applicable to leadership. So when you look at center of gravity, just as a quick definition, Center of gravity is really, what is the strength of a thing, right? What is the strength? What is the, the center focus, the key nexus, if you will, of performance or how they do things? And if we look at our organizations and how organizations function and accomplish the mission, you gotta ask the question, what is the center of gravity? Is it the employees or is it the leaders? And a lot of people really believe, well, it's the leaders because we are in charge, right? We set the vision, we do this, but we're not doing the work. It's the employees. Employees are the center of gravity. The key thing to understand is this, we lead and manage the people that do the work. We no longer do the work. Hence again, we have a different function. We have different roles, being a leader and being a manager than we used to prior to being promoted. So now when we talk about the fog of war, the fog of war as, as Karl von Koschwitz intended is this. When military leaders or any soldier based on his approach goes into combat and you have casualties and you have death and you have all these distractions and it literally fell on a battlefield or ill-prepared, ill-prepared, find themselves struggling with making decisions. They find themselves struggling with taking the right, cor right courses of action because they're more focused on the distractions and they have nothing to default to. Meaning, if you don't already have the skills or have a good idea or understanding or baseline capabilities, when you find yourself at that crossroads of adversity, you're gonna get paralyzed. Well, as a high-performing leader and as a high-performing manager, 
That is not the time to be paralyzed. That is the time to take action. So don't get caught up in that day-to-day -day fog of war of just being transactional. When we look at leaders, here's the key thing to understand. Leaders, you are the center of gravity for organizational culture. And why? It's simply this. You've got the power, right? You've got the position. You've got the title. You can't got the authority and influence to make change and control the change within your organization. This is why you can take a low-performing organization and bring in a high-performing leader, and that organizational performance metric goes up dramatically depending on how impactful that leader is and or what their lines of effort. But then you take a high-performing leader, I'm gonna, I'm gonna change that around, you take a high-performing organization and you bring in a low-performing leader, and what do you think happens to that organization? That organization starts to go down performance. Don't take my word for it. There's too many empirical studies out there that'll vet this out. So let's take a look at what organizational culture is really about. And I kind of broke it down using this graphic and I'll keep it simple. It starts with leader behaviors. What are our values? How do we engage with our people? Lines or processes do we set? It's about our practices and team cohesion. You know, in a special forces team, optimally functioning, we have 12 people. Each person on that team has a position, meaning they have a skill in their position. A weapons sergeant, an engineer sergeant, an intelligence sergeant, a medical sergeant, a communication sergeant. You get what I'm saying? Everybody has a skill, and every position has a senior and junior position. So we're in nonstop coaching. Do you see how we've set up our practices to say, we are now leveraging different competencies and different skill sets, leveraging that towards our identified mission, which puts us more into that high performing category. If we look at a shared purpose, values and goals, most organizations, and I'm gonna ask you guys a question, this is rhetorical, but I'd like to hear some, some feedback at the end when we get into questions and answers time. Do you guys have a mission statement for your organization? And if you work for Boeing or you work for Bechtel or you work for Mission Support Alliance, and I can go on, right? Blue Cross, Blue Shield. I'm not talking about the corporate mission statement. That's beautiful in quotes on the website. That's probably six pages long, I'm kidding. I'm talking about for your organization. If you work in the human resources organization of Blue Cross Blue Shield, think about it. Your mission is gonna be different than the overall organizational mission. So what is the mission for your functional area? You have to ask yourself that question because all those employees, they should understand it and they should be leveraging or aligning their jobs, their lines of effort towards completing that mission. And let me bring the generational thing back up. If you're talking about the Zillennials and the Millennials, here's what they want. They want to know, what is our mission? Where are we going? And where do I fit into it? My generation is like, how much am I getting paid? Right? When do we get paid? Job security? Do I get a retirement? Do I get a pension? All right, I'll suck it up and drive on. This doesn't play anymore with the new workforce. And we'll talk more about that moving forward. Then we look at... Uh, you know, what's visible in our day-to-day -day efforts, right? A high-performing team. As we in every day, are we engaging with one another? Is that what our culture's like? If I have a differing professional opinion, do I first put the shields up and start competing with you? Or do I keep the shields down, bring you closer in, and together we discuss it? Maybe you'll learn something. Maybe I'll learn something. So how do we conduct our day-to-day -day business, right? What are our displayed behaviors? Because on this personal side, we typically marry our opposites, don't we? We typically seek out someone who's different from us. You know, hence that aphorism, opposites attract. You can use the, 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 the Chinese theory of yin and yang, creating harmonic balance within specific relationships. The same thing applies. But for some reason, when we get to the workforce, differing personalities usually res results in conflict, right? Well, does your organization display the behaviors that when we have a difference we embrace where that person's coming from and seek guidance and clarifying questions so we better understand. And if we disagree, we, we agree to disagree. And we say, we're still friends. We're still teammates. We're still shipmates, right? We'll try it this way. If it doesn't work, we got a great backup, okay? And remember, the number one reasons why people quit year after year after year after year, they quit bad bosses. And bad bosses set 
the culture for the organization. So bottom line up front, if you look internally and you're in charge of your organization, I'm gonna throw something at you, you may not like it, I'm keeping it real. If your culture and your organization is bad and you are in charge of that organization, you need to look in the mirror. You need to do some self-awareness and find out what am I doing wrong? What are my opportunities to change this around? As we set the culture, all right, driving up. I get long-winded, you guys, I get excited about this stuff. So we're really talking about maximizing employee engagement for the, the statistics I shared with you, and I'll, I'll give you more. Employee leadership is not only engaging with our employees, but it's literally transferring control from me as a manager, because again, manager is more transactional, maintaining control, managing with that control. Here's what I'm saying. Let's shift the control over to our employees. Yeah, we can take a trust, but verify approach, right? But again, we cannot be in all places at all times. That's not our job anymore. It's their job. We lead and manage the people who do the work. We no longer do the work. It's a different role. And so we need to transfer that control to them because if we do, it, we're in fact empowering them. We're giving them ownership. So if you say, you hear that word empowerment, and you think you're empowering your employees, do they fully understand, is it clear to them that they are in control of their line of effort? This is mine. I own this. Drive it like you own it. Not like you stole it, but like you own it. All right. And then this requires a deep understanding of our employees. So we've been talking a lot about understanding ourselves, right? But now we have to start to understand our people because, again, as I said, we've got to lead everyone and everyone's different. We all have different motivations depending on our past, our experiences, our ambitions, and our personal goals. By understanding your people, by understanding your people, you will, in fact, start to demonstrate, a, how should I say it, higher levels of emotional intelligence because you're going to be hypersensitive. You're going to be hypersensitive. You're going to empathize more. You're going to be more understanding. And think about it. If people are quitting this, I think it's a very good chance that they're quitting this because they do not think that we care about them. How many people are more likely going to quit their job knowing that their boss has an unconditional positive regard for them? Most people won't. It's going to be something my husband is being transferred, my wife is being transferred, right? Or I'm moving back home with my, you know, there's going to be something else. They're not going to leave because of us or because of a bad culture that we facilitated. It's also going to integrate employees into the mission. So when we talk about inclusion, my version of inclusion is if you've got a seat at the table, you've got a seat at the table. If you're on the team, you're on the team. With employee-centric leadership, that is one of our practices. It's one of our concepts. If you're brand new right out of college, if you're brand new right out of trade school, if you're brand new to the organization, you're at that table in that employee uh, staff meeting, guess what? I want to hear what you have to say. I don't care how much experience you have. I don't care what your background is. I mean, I care, right? But I want to, I care about you and what your viewpoint is. What, what, what are your lens telling you? What are your thoughts? A lot of times we have this new generation come into the workforce and we have X generation and we have the baby boomers who are in charge. And we say, oh, you youngsters, you got to make your bones. You millennials, oh my gosh, there's a millennial problem. People just don't know that it's a different approach. All right, let me drive on. Employee-centric leadership theory, understanding the center of gravity. We got to make sure our employees understand that they're valued and we have to empower them and we need to engage them. And so here's a simple chart I brought up. Look to the upper left when you see culture of engagement. And it's a simple question. Does your organization have a culture that motivates, empowers, challenges, and respects employees? What would they say? Can we take these questions that I've given you, put this in a little, what do they call that, uh, that uh, little survey tool that you can use, right? And throw it out there to your team? Try it. How about motivating and relating? Do managers motivate their employees to give them, to give their best? Motivating employees, they didn't teach that in college. They didn't teach that in trade school. I learned that as a civil engineer. Probably not. That's why you need to come to National Management Association webinars and, and trainings that they provide so that you can learn how to motivate people. Are managers building strong relationships and developing cohesive teams? We go down to strategic alignment, I alluded to this earlier, do employees understand what the mission is and where do they fit into the mission, right? What am I working towards? Because this newer generation, no matter how much they're getting paid, 
they're not comfortable with being the hamster in the wheel, right? And, and take a note of this. Don't take my word for it, study it. Millennials, out of all the generations, it's not that they lack loyalty, they wanna be challenged, they wanna grow. And if they are not getting that within that organization, that organization's culture, they're gonna leave. And the studies are showing that millennials are leaving organizations within the first year to two years. They are very mobile. And if you don't treat them right, that workforce is gonna transition to someplace that will. And then managing the execution, right? Are we clearly defining the expectations? Do people know what we expect of them? Have we done, I'll give you a, a little tip, R2A2, roles, responsibilities, accountabilities, and authorities. Has that been laid out? And please don't tell me anything about a position description because all of us on this, this, this conference, on this talk, we know that position descriptions are not accurate to what we do day in and day out. But taking inventory of clear roles and responsibilities, that will, that will. And that's a living document, by the way. So here's just some studies. You know, Gallup finds that employees who are involved in enthusiastic about and committed to the work in the workplace, they are engaged, right? Organizations with moderate to high level of engagement usually sees 22% higher productivity, right? And, and there's some more stats that we've got here. I just wanted to put this up. 48% fewer safety accidents. This is key. We have less safety incidents, less quality incidents, less patient issues if you're in the healthcare, when employees feel engaged, motivated, and are empowered. It's crazy, but the studies don't lie. And there's multiple from different studies that talk about it. Retention, it costs us an arm and a leg to staff someone. Quickly think about this. You lose one of your key players. Number one, they're taking that tribal knowledge or that, that site-specific knowledge, right? They're taking that with them. And then we bring someone else into the organization. They may have the degree or the education or the certificate, but how long is it gonna take them to go from forming, storming, to norming and performing. That's gonna take them a while. So all that time, they're not operating at full capacity. And not to mention that usually you can put a birthday candle in some of these postings we put out, right? How long does it take to hire and onboard someone to our organization? Engage with them, treat them right, you're gonna retain them, and they're gonna perform at a higher level. And another question, is your management team truly engaged with your employees? Yes or no, what would they say? If you did an employee viewpoint survey today, tomorrow, next week, what would the employees say? Are we engaged with that? If so, what does our percentage look like? Because some of the percentages now, depending on where you look, only 16% of employers are engaged according to their employees. Only 16%. Yeah, there's a lot of opportunity to grow that, right? Um, so ask your employees, find out. And here's another one, and I've done this. I may repeat myself, but let me, this is worth repeating. If you ask your employees right now, do managers prioritize you or the mission, what would they say? Or the stats? The employees are gonna say, my managers prioritize the mission, not us. It's all about the mission. And guess what? We think managers say when you ask them, you're right. Managers say, no, we prioritize our employees. So we have this disparity, right? This lack of continuity of, of understanding and, and because of that lack of continuity of understanding, that affects our motivation to do our work. We need to make sure we have that continuity of understanding. Here's our generations. This is kind of a snapshot. And because the lineals just really rolled out last year, year and a half, you don't, you're not seeing a lot, a lot of, of, of uh, understanding about the, the personalities and dispositions and tendencies of this new generation. But where the science is going and at Team Concepts, we try to keep our finger on the pulse. We're starting to see that the zillennials are very much like the millennials, with the only change that they're capturing right now is that zillennials are a little bit more entrepreneurial, which I find to be awesome. We can work with that, right? So let's talk about how different generations communicate. Baby boomers, there it is. We're 1946 to 1964, right? No one has to raise their hand or put anything in the chat box, identify yourself unless you want to. But our communication was face-to-face. -face. It was phone call. It was that interpersonal engagement, direct. Gen X came in and said, you know, we can deal with it face-to-face, -face, but guess what? Baby boomers, we have this thing called internet now. It's amazing, right? And the wheel, I'm kidding. Um, so they liked clear, direct, and transparent. And there was a key, transparency. So they wanted, if you know something, share it with me. Don't hide anything. I want to be part of this. And that continued on with the new generation. Yes, the X-Gen was slightly skeptical of the old school managers and leaders, 
But now we got into the, the, the new generation. They wanted that transparency, but they also wanted to know what is our mission? What is our vision? What is our, what is our strategy? And again, where do I fit in? Where do I fit in? Keep in mind, millennials are very hyper-connected. They're very technology-driven. And people used to say when they see millennials walking through the parks with their faces glued to their, their cell phones, they used to say, these are antisocial. That's not true. It was the technology that facilitated that hyper-connectivity need that millennials have. And millennials are much the same. So what did we value in the different generations? Well, my generation, experience, expertise, hence, when that young person comes on board, you got to make your bones. You got to demonstrate. You got to prove yourself. Can you see how we're already building a gap right there between the two generations? Right? We, we value that loyalty, right? Your political knowledge, your institutional knowledge. But then Gen X, they, they wanted efficiency, right? They wanted a work life balance, right? I have a family. That's important. I need to take care of them, hence, job security. And millennials and also zillennials. They still want that fast-paced work environment that, that X-Gen wanted, but they want empowerment. They need empowerment. They need to get it, and they want to be a part of it. They want creativity and innovation. They don't want the same old, same old. Ain't broke, don't fix it. Does not play well with the new generation, right? And as I said, they're hyper-connected. So how do we approach work? My generation, you're here to work. Leave your personal stuff at home. Well, we now know in the 21st century, everything at work includes personnel and personalities. And guess what? You find yourself as a leader, you'll have roles like psychologist, marriage counselor, right? Ad addiction therapist, all of the above, all duties unassigned are yours, right? And our action, working independently, learning to fly, multitasking, or equal to the task. With a new generation close to that Gen X, they're all about working together. They love collaboration. And here's another key, the work, they want the work to be meaningful. I'm not just doing this because you tell me to do it. I'm doing this because I love to do it and I, I feel valued when I do it. Hence engagement, hence employee-centric leadership. I'm giving them ownership. Trust but verify, I'm giving them ownership so that they feel empowered and they feel about a part of something better. Believe it or not, you're not gonna believe it. The newer generations, millennials and zillennials, they actually wanna be happy at work. Go we'll figure, most of our life is spent at work. I think they're onto something, folks. All right, so here's some numbers. 26%, um, um, again, according to this study, are actively disengaged. 29% of the workforce engage. 45% are not engaged, depending on which study you look at. Bottom line up front, whether you're saying 16% that I cited you earlier or 26% from another study, it's still not a good number. When you know the value of engagement, when you know it increases productivity, it reduces safety incidents, it gives us higher quality of work, et cetera, et cetera, higher retention. Why are we not doing this? I believe employee-centric le leadership is the key to making it happen. So here's some strategies. We need to connect with our people, right? We need to demonstrate, this is Dr. Carl Rogers, circa 1957-59, depending on which paper you read. But Dr. Carl Rogers says, demonstrate an unconditional positive regard like we who are parents do with our children, right? They may get in, they may get in our, <laughs> on our every last nerve sometime, but we love our children. We care about them, and there's nothing we would not do for them. Take this to our work family as an employee-centric leadership, as an employee-centric leader. What if your employees felt, perceived, that you actually had an unconditional positive regard, that you cared for them that much? How might they perform for you? So I think we're on with something. Connect. Career. Connect with them, find out where they wanna go. Where do they see themselves in five years? When's the last time your boss brought you in the office and say, hey, where do you see yourself in the next five years? Positive affirmation, you've been doing great. You're my go-to person. I value your contributions. But I wanna make sure I'm part of supporting where you wanna go. Even if it's up and out of our organization, I wanna support you. We're not doing that enough. And on this career thing, another study for you, and again, I will give you citations for anything that you wish to support what I'm sharing with you, because this is all validated. It's, it's all common sense as well. But the studies are showing us that employees feel, if my boss really cared and wanted to engage and develop me, really cared about my career, he or she would say something. We would have that conversation. Here's what managers are saying. You guys are probably already on it. If my employees really wanted to do something with their career in advance, they'd approach me and they'd tell me about it. Right? 
you see the break. Again, another break in continuity of understanding. And again, are they seeing their job as a job or as a career? It's gonna give you different performance outcomes. Clarity, are we being clear? Do they know the vision? Do they know the mission? Do they know where we wanna go? Right? Do they know the importance that they bring into the organization? Do they know how their position, right, specifically supports operational goals and operational mission? This is important, this is part of engagement strategies. And congratulate, right, studies again show when we engage with our people on a day-to-day -day basis, we're mostly engaging to say, hey, what's the status on this? Can I get an update on this? What are our metrics looking like on this? How about, what do you guys got going on this weekend? Hannah, your daughter's Hannah, right? Is she still playing soccer? Right? And even if you can't remember, go to an employee on a Friday and say, what do you got going? Well, we're going to a soccer tournament. If you can't remember, write it down in your office, put in a sticky on your screen, turn the lights out, you go home too, and on Monday morning, you say, I was handed a soccer tournament. This is not being fake. When you are willing to do whatever it takes to engage with your employee to build better relationships, that's an honorable and noble endeavor, and there's nothing fake about it. We use any tool and every tool at our disposal to build stronger, high-performing teams. So congratulate often. Make sure that they know that they're valued and contribute. I, I've alluded to this a lot. People want to know where they fit in. Make sure they understand how they're contributing to the mission. Make sure they understand how their lines of effort aligns with our organizational strategy, our vision, and our goals. And control. I've already said, employee-centric leadership, we are transferring control over to our people and not ourselves as managers maintaining control for ourselves. It's going to make us higher performing. I had a uh, a senior leader come through our leadership academy not too long ago, and we conduct classes every week. Um, and, and she said specifically, I find myself getting down in the weeds with my people. And I think I'm, I'm too much in the weeds with my people. You probably are. If you think that, you, you, imagine what your employee is saying. They're like, oh, yes, please remove them from the weeds at any time. Thank you. They're going to perceive you as a micromanager. But if you transfer control, trust but verify, to your people and you're empowering them and they are taking the ball and running with it, then you can separate, still maintain some connectivity, but get up here and do your job. You know, manage that vision, look at the metrics, set key performance goals, right? Set performance parameters, all the things that leaders and managers should do. You can't do that when you're caught up in the day to day and you're in the weeds. So transfer that control, collaborate, facilitate collaboration within the team and you as a leader, if you got a decision to make and you have time, can you not ping your people to get their feedback on it? And so that when you make that decision, they feel as though they were a part of the decision. Even if you don't take on all that they suggest, at least you engage them and collaborated with them on it. If you're gonna write a mission statement for your functional area, here's a quick tip. I think everybody should go back and do it if you don't already have one. Let's do it as a lunch and learn, right? Let's start this out, bring all the employees in, Bring some Starbucks, some donuts, whatever you got to bring in. Let's have fun and let's put our heads together as a team. Why the team and setting that organization's mission statement? Because they're the ones who are doing the work. They're going to take ownership of it, right? And they're going to most likely embrace it. And if it doesn't work out, they're not going to be looking at you, holding you accountable. We're going to hold ourselves accountable and we're going to change. So great leaders are team builders. We create this environment, a culture that fosters trust and collaboration. And think about this, and I know I'm speaking fast and trying to fit everything into our, our time allotted, but I will stay as long as needed. Trust. How many of you openly trust people that you don't like? Something to think about, right? So for people who say work is work, home is home, personal, professional, we don't mix. This is your work family. In the 21st century, you need to embrace that concept. Build relationships, because when you like the people working to the left and right of you, that goes with job satisfaction. When you like the people to the left and right of you, you're more likely to trust them. You're, less, you're more likely to look for the better in them when times of conflict arises. You're gonna insulate, are you okay? What can I do? Relationships. All right, employee-centric leadership theory, driving on. Credibility, leader's credibility is based on how you behave, how you're modeling, your role modeling, right? Um, Dr. Bandura's uh, theory of behavioral modeling. Leaders that model bad behaviors lose credibility within the organization. When we see our leader engage with another teammate 
in, in a very unprofessional way or not showing unconditional positive regard or not engaging, that's where we lose credibility. It's rarely because of their lack of technical knowledge. It's how they engage with people. That's what we're judging. So it's, it's, it's really about you and your ability to engage with your people. In confidence, you have to have self-confidence. You have to demonstrate that confidence. Also, is confidence not being able to say, you know what, I made a decision and that was not one of my best decisions. That was not one of my best decisions. And I want everybody to know it, but we had a backup. So we're gonna go with plan B. And I think everybody was unsupported of that. We're gonna roll with that. What if you make a mistake? Can we not go back? Is that not showing your confidence and your strength by saying, I apologize. If I came off that way and you felt this, I'm truly sorry for that. There's no shame in that game. You're not weak, you're strong. And it shows leader confidence. So think about confidence and then convey. Let them know what you expect out of them. Ask them what they expect out of you. Make sure you have that clear continuity of communication and meet and meet often. When's the last time you sat for a one-on-one -on -one with your manager or your leader of the organization? If I have them in my leadership academy on day one, what they're usually telling me is, well, you know, every six months if we get time, but most certainly for the annual review. Is that the time to meet with someone when you're, you're assessing them or evaluating them for the whole year? Or should we be meeting with them at least quarterly to make sure we're keeping them on track to make sure we are understanding, mutually understanding each other's expectations so we can be successful together instead of waiting till the end of the year? Keep that in mind. And then I talked about roles, responsibilities, accountabilities, and authorities. And perhaps in a separate web webinar, I'll go more into detail with that. Maybe have a webinar on operational design, which is some new theories. Uh, very cool stuff. So we need to understand establish a culture within our organization, a culture of trust, a culture of a work family. If you have something to say, say it. You got a seat at the table, you have a seat at the table. Say what you got to say. I want you engaged, right? When you think about some of the most troubled employees in organizations, they usually take up the majority of that manager or supervisor's time. And you all are probably nodding north and south. Yes, that's true. Well, guess what? They're not engaged. They're isolated. And guess what? A lot of managers' approaches for dealing with problem employees as a conflict avoidingly engage, if you will, it's almost like an oxymoron, is to isolate them away so that they don't spoil the rest of the team. And that somehow is a leadership strategy? Absolutely not. When you have a bad employee, you need to bring them in and bring them in close. Sit down with them, utilizing unconditional positive regard and get to the root cause of what is going on with them. What is going on? It could have been the experience they had with the previous manager. But you got to find out, bring them in close. Insulate, don't isolate. Now I want to briefly talk about personal and professional intelligence theory. This is another uh, methodology that we created at the Leadership Academy. And it really, I'm going to keep it simple. Um, how many of you recognize this quote? If you know the enemy, you know yourself. You need not fear the result of 100 battles. Right? Some of you are yelling up on the other side of the screen, Sun Tzu, Sun Tzu. It was. 3,000 years ago, that, that, that brilliant uh, strategist, military theorist, that Chinese general who later became one of the most hailed philosophers of China throughout history, uh, that's what he said. And that was a motivator for me when I looked at that and I read his transcripts, The Art of War, and I said, well, if you know the enemy and you know yourself, think about this. What if I, I know my team and I know myself? I know my organization and I know myself. Will I not be predisposed to be successful, engage better, increase productivity, reduce employee attrition? You see what we're saying? So I use this to say, I'm going to bring my people in close and get to know them. And by doing so, I will not succumb to the fog of war that other managers do because I'm hyper aware. It is literally a practice. Sun Tzu went on to say, if you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you're going to suffer defeat. Right? He then said, if you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. And that is von Clausewitz's true intent of fog of war. Don't get caught up, my friends. Don't get caught up. Learn what you need to learn. Know yourself. Know your people. And it's nonstop. It's ongoing. Just the fact that you're willing to do it is putting you above and beyond. So if you look at our personal and personal professional intelligence model, it's really simple. It's a phased approach. Initially, we're going to start, we need to know ourselves. 
what are my behaviors, right? Now, am, I, am I emotionally intelligent? Am I not? Am I an introvert? Am I an extrovert, right? Um, what, what are my skill sets? My interpersonal skills, my, my job skills, right? Remember, my skills as a leader and as a manager are different than my skills um, as a project control specialist or an HR professional, right? It, it's a different set of skills. What are my skills? And then I literally conduct a SWOT analysis, my strengths, my weaknesses. What are the opportunities? What am I doing that can be perceived as an immediate threat right now that I may need to prioritize, which takes me over to personal management, right? Once I know what I know, I'm gonna look at that SWOT analysis and I'm gonna put together a plan. What do I need to fix? How do I need to fix it? What do I need to prioritize and then engage? When we look at our organization in this, I broke it up in the strategic, operational, tactical, from the highest to the lowest, I can look at my organization, I can look at my manager, right? Hierarchy of the organization, if I'm an organizational leader. What does that level one manager, executive want from my department? Am I aligned with them? Do we understand one another, right? I'm gonna gain that intelligence so I can operate better at my functional level. We're gonna look operationally. What is our organization's culture like, right? What does our diversity mix look like? And when I talk about diversity, my friends, this is a whole other webinar again. Um, I, take, I, I take a different approach. I like science. And science tells us that when you diversify a group, you get better performance, right? And it's not just black and white and female and male. It's generational. It's different perspectives. It's different lenses by different ways we look at things, different experiences, how we were raised, all that factors in. We want to avoid that homogenous group thing, right? So we're gonna bring in diverse groups because we get better performance. I always hold, it's not a racial thing. It's a productivity thing. It's a common sense thing because the science tells us diversify your organization. So I'm gonna take a look at that. I'm gonna look, what, what, what does our organization look like? Do we wanna diversify? Can we, well, we always wanna diversify, but do we need a little bit more? Where are we at? And again, we're gonna separate. We're not talking quotas. We're not talking reverse discrimination. We're gonna always hire the most qualified person for the job. But if I've got three and four most qualified people for the job, as many of us usually do when we hire, I'm gonna look at my organization and see what I've got. I'm gonna say, what can I bring in to add, to contribute to our growth? And then at that tactical level, know your people. Know your people. I may start that first because they are the center of gravity of getting the work done. And once you've looked at your professional analysis, your organizational analysis, then you simply say, okay, same thing. What is my SWAT? Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. What do I wanna start on first? And maybe in this case, I can do a couple things. If it's something organizational, maybe I can engage my employees to help me in a work group. What can we do better? Let's do some continuous improvement, some lean, right? Or Six Sigma, structured improvement activities, do a Kaizen or something, all right? I'm rushing through it, but I'm, I'm willing and ready for your questions. So when doing a self-assessment, you guys have this slide. I, I wanted to include it. It's kind of common sense, but it gives you some ideas of what a SWOT, a personal SWOT looks like. Typically, SWOT analysis is, are, have always been used in business. It's taught in business, you know, uh, at the undergraduate level and even higher, depending on what your MBA is in. But use it for yourself. It works. So we're going to drive on. Emotional intelligence, this is the big, this is the most popular, popular leadership skill sought in the 21st century. Again, 21st century, we're talking about what's new. And what's new is this, hiring managers by 72%, depending on what study you look at, the 70 to 72% to 75%, they're looking for leaders, for employees with higher levels of emotional intelligence. And I'm gonna tell you exactly what emotional intelligence really is. This is the EQI model, and I'm, I'm glad you guys have a copy of this presentation, because if you just take a minute and you look at this, look at all those areas that we're talking about. We, we think social, emotional intelligence, we just think warm and fuzzy, how people feel. Well, it goes with emotions and feelings, but now we're talking about self-perception, self-regard. We're talking about how we express ourselves. Are we independent operators, right? Are we assertive? Are we non-assertive? Do we have relationships? Do we build relationships easier? Or am I that person that finds myself solo on an island of myself, right? Decision-making, this is key. How do I make decisions? How do I control my impulses? Am I a patient person? Am I, do, I, do I rush to judgment? 
Do I let my emotions get the best out of me in stressful situations when we're on the stress management, right? How do I solve problems? Am I optimistic, am I not? This is a very in-depth. So the EQI 2.0 in our Leadership Academy, everyone going through all phases from aspiring leadership to middle level management to executive leadership, every single uh, person coming through our Leadership Academy gets this psychometric. It's a level B psychometric assessment. You have to be a practitioner to administer it. Everyone gets this. And we go over it during the class because we want to help them find their natural style of leadership. And I often find that my analytical friends typically score lower on empathy. And I point out to them, it doesn't mean you're evil Santa, right? Although some of your employees may label you as such during Christmas time, right? It doesn't mean that, it just means you're more analytical, you prioritize the work and the knowledge and the technology over how people feel about administering that work, that technology, right? So we'll talk a little bit more about emotional intelligence, but it's really about social skills, social skills. Emotional intelligence is the latest and greatest phrase for capturing a person's social skills at a very deep level. Because this is a leadership webinar, I also wanted to share Daniel Goleman's six styles of leadership. So his six styles of leadership correlates to that model I shared with you. It brings that out and I'll tell you how it does. Commanding. A person who's more commanding will find themselves usually more that analytical person, that person who exercises more management versus leadership. They demand immediate compliance. Incidentally, leaders who take on the commanding style, hey, I need you to do this, I need you to do this. I need a status in this, okay, I'll, here, this is what I want. He said, what do you think? Commanders, they typically have the lowest ranking from their employees because it's not conducive to a high performing environment as these managers typically think it is. In fact, their people feel restricted and that they're waiting to be commanded to do something. They're not gonna make a decision on their own because they're waiting for somebody to tell them to make that decision, right? It's gonna bite them in the fourth point of contact. So we try to minimize that as much as possible. But here's our visionary. We wanna mobilize people towards a vision. Think about employee-centric leadership. That's exactly what we're doing. We're laying out what our vision is, what our mission is, and how our people are crucial to accomplishing that. And by doing that, they understand their value to the organization and the organization's mission. Affiliative, creating those emotional bonds, harmony, team cohesiveness. Again, you can see in employee-centric leadership, I'm gonna to get to know my people to make sure that they respect the differences and that our differences makes us stronger. If I have an, an analytical person working with an emotional and in, in, um, intuitive person, right, the, the, the broader conceptual person working with that person, according to Dr. Jung's theory, that sensing person who's more analytical, instead of us going like this, we should be going like this because we're seeing things clearly more objectively because we're both bringing something to the picture. That means we have to be able to get along in order to do that. So affiliative leaders, democratic building consensus, team participation and engagement, they're more likely to support and they're less resistant to change. Are you a pace setter? Pace setter, again, you look at this, expect excellence, self-direction. That sounds awesome. However, like commanding, it falls in that category of having a negative impact on organizational climate because what leaders typically do to embrace pace setting as a leadership style they are setting the standard high, which is a good thing. But again, you're only as fast as your slowest person. And if you think about it, we're all going on a run. See, I don't run a seven minute mile like some of you may be running now or a six minute mile, right? I think we're all gonna run at different levels. And if my leader is starting out because he or she runs that seven minute mile and I run a nine minute mile, what's gonna happen? I'm falling back. I'm getting more and more disconnected. And then what happens when we check out? because you just drop out of the run. I cannot keep up. And you quit. You quit on yourself, it hurts your self-confidence. Getting you back on board is gonna be very, very difficult. So watch pace setting. It's a good thing if you use it, maybe in combination with some of these other styles. And then coaching, right? Developing people for the future. But here's what coaching's really about. Coaching is different than mentoring. Mentoring is more that, that sage of wisdom, that, that, that consultant, that, that career counselor in school. Um, that person you bring under your wing and you give them uh, guidance of, of, of better decisions. Coaching is literally giving the skill, transferring knowledge, right? helping them do things better. 
So what a lot of managers do is they say, you're not doing this right. You're supposed to be doing this. Well, let's take a moment as an employee centric leader to show them what right looks like. Let's do this together. Let's coach them so that they can be successful because people want to be successful. When you can give your people wins, they want it. You get that dopamine dump, that Tiger Woods fist pump, they want more of that. You as a leader can facilitate that neurotransmitter release of dopamine that people just love and get addicted to. It's a good addiction in this case. All right, here's some closing points. And I can't believe it, I think we're, I think we're on time, on schedule, I kind of like that, that military coming back. 21st century leaders requires different skills than the traditional managers. Keep in mind, we have a newer generation that requires different skills of our managers and our leaders than before, right? And you need to take, you have to look inward. How would you assess your leadership skill? This is getting you on your journey. Based on what we've talked about, based on these slides that you guys have copies of, and I want you to use them. I want you to share them, right? And feel free to call us or contact us for any more additional knowledge. I mean, we have a leadership academy, for goodness sake. Come on out. We'll help you out, or we'll go out there and help you out. We'll get you on point. How would you assess your leadership skills? Do a SWOT analysis. Maximize your strengths. Minimize those threats. Fill those gaps. Are you more of a leader or a manager? This is important to understand. And, and let me make a very key point, and I put this at the end for a reason. You cannot have just a great leader or a great manager. Leadership and management have to coincide. They have to coexist. One is not exclusive of the other. Because management, those transactional skills that we have to do is part of our job as well. We need to make sure we're taking note of the metrics. We need to make sure we're setting the metrics. We need to make sure we're, we're budgeting. We're doing those time cards. We're projecting. We have to do those management things. But on the leadership style, on the leadership side, we've got to be connected with our people. We have to know our people. We have to know how to motivate them. And again, each person is different. They have their own unique motivators, and you need to know that, and that's what a leader is going to do. So you see how we have to have that mix and that balance? And guess what? It's also going to depend on what your organization looks like, that professional intelligence. Am I leading an engineering team, and they're mostly analytical people, right? then you have to find that balance. What do they need based on our job and based on our people? Remember, employee centric leaderships, you're not in charge of the work. You're in charge of the people that are in charge of the work. It's a different approach, right? You are leading the people who are leading their efforts. You're just simply there to support them. That is what our role should be, and that's how we should look at it. They, our employees, are the center of gravity. They are the strength, they are the most important aspect of a company getting the work done. As a leader, as a manager, we are guiding, we are empowering, we are inspiring, we are supporting, and we are looking to the future so that we can take our people, all of us together, participating together as a team, to the highest levels possible. This is what employee centric is gonna give you. And make sure, Make sure you realize that you as a leader, you as a manager, because of your power, your position, your authority, it gives you that influence over all in your organization. You set the culture. It's up to you. Think about that culture. Think about what culture is. A culture of we have something to say, we say it, and we respect each other's viewpoints, right? When it comes to conflict, we, we insulate. We don't isolate. We don't compete. Let's talk it out. Let's hear it. If I'm upset, I'm going to say I'm upset, but I'm going to listen to you. We take it to that next level because this is what a high-performing team looks like. All right, so questions and comments, a little animation. I want you guys to be supermen and women out there with employee-centric leadership theory, not this person who's find themselves in that fog of war and they don't know what to do. And that is not the time to know. Start to build your skills as a leader. We at the Leadership Academy for Team Concepts, we're always here to support you, just like the National Management Association, and they do a fantastic job. Steve, do we have any questions? Um, I don't see anything in the chat room, but I'm gonna unmute everybody here Excellent. and give folks an opportunity to throw in at you. So we've only got a couple minutes. So um, anybody wanna step forward with a question or comment? Uh, Sally, this is Lindsay from the Boeing Leadership Association in Southern California. Hi, Lindsay. A question. 
Hi. So a question that I have, um, I wrote down, you know, employees in charge of the work, and I absolutely agree. But in today's world, a lot of times the leader is also a player. Um, how do you balance being a player and a coach and letting your team be in charge of the work? I, I love it. And, and it makes perfect sense because depending on how your operation is, your operation is designed, you may be a worker leader, a worker manager, a manager or supervisor. I get it. So all we do is this, we look at what the mission is, what our function is, who we have on the team, how many people do I have? How do I divide that work up? Obviously, I need to make sure that I'm doing my management and leadership stuff, right? And not, how should I say this, and you're probably knowing where I'm going with, going with this, who are in that position, they take a lot on themselves. It's overwhelming. Not only am I doing the job as a manager and a leader, I'm also doing the work too. And I get myself in the weeds because I have to be in the weeds because I also have a line of effort, but I also need to manage and lead. We need to first tip, build that coalition of the willing. You may be the supervisor or the team lead, but you probably have someone on your team who is also an aspiring leader, that person who will be there to support you. You don't have to do it on your own and see if they can help support coaching. Peer coaching is one of the better forms of coaching Utilizing, leveraging that subject matter expert, right? He or she who's doing the coaching, they're better. That's going to build a relationship between them and that other teammate that they're coaching. And that frees you up. So now our teammates are going to each other because we've identified those subject matter experts instead of, again, taking more time that you may not. That's kind of a quick tip or a quick approach. Look at your people, align your organization, and try to bring people in as that coalition of the world to support you. Did that help at all, Lindsay? Yes, thank you very much. I hope so, thank you. <laughs> okay, anybody else? I know we're running a little long, but we got time for another question, if anybody wants. All right, well, then I wanna, on behalf of all of us, um, thank Seming for a great workshop. It's a lot, a lot of information conveyed. Um, it's amazing to me how emotional intelligence, the subject, is uh, starting to really permeate organizations. I think people, when it first came out, everybody's like, that's nice. <clears throat> and over time, I think leaders have realized there's really something to it. And um, you took it to that level, Sammy, so thank you. Thank you, my friend. Thank you, everybody. It was great being with you. All right. Uh, we want to thank everyone. Uh, today is Thursday, so that means there's a weekend on the horizon. So let me wish everyone a nice weekend. And those of you that have uh, travel plans the following weekend for Memorial Day, please be safe. So thank you so much. Thank you, Semi. And um, if you want to join us again at 3 o'clock Eastern Time, let us know. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.